Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and our expository study of the book of Revelation. We are continuing our look at Revelation chapter 12 and we'll cover verses 10 through 17 and we've titled this study Satanic War on Israel. This is part one of two. Uh, we have one copy of A Woman Rides the Beast, if you haven't read this yet. Um, this is a, uh, she must have left that on the whole time. Can you stop it and restart it? Oh, you did. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If anybody wants that, it's up here. Uh, just a FYI rem reminder, we have King James Bibles if you want them. There's a couple of those left still. And then we have these millions disappear. It's about the rapture. And, uh. The book? Yeah. Hillary Rice, Well, I can tell you it's about the Roman Catholic Church. You're going to be upset. <laughs> it's not Hillary. But, uh, all right, let's get into our study. We're, going to, we're finishing a uh, study of Revelation 12 tonight. And uh, I titled it Satanic War on Israel. And, of course, you'll see why in just a minute. And as you read, keep in mind we already laid this groundwork. The woman that we're talk talking about is Israel in Revelation 12. The child is Jesus. The dragon, and also referred to as the serpent, is Satan. The stars are angels. And uh, we pick up in verse 10. So go ahead and read that with me. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of His Christ, for the accuser of the brethren is cussed, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, uh, that is a prophetic statement in heaven. And I want to explain something real quick before we move on. There are some teachers that I respect that have a little different take on the book of Revelation. And what they teach is that when you read about the seals and the trumpets and the vials, that you're reading three different versions of the same events. So if you were to put it on a map or a chart, it would be seven years like here, and then you'd have seals, trumpets, and vials all within the seven years running concurrent, or uh, what's the word, parallel to each other. And that... I believe is a stretch, and that's why I don't teach it that way. Um, but they make a decent case. I give them credit. But there are areas when you study it, you're going to say that doesn't match, and they just say, well, it just, you know, it's not going to match perfect. Well, I think the Bible will match perfect, and that's why I believe what we're seeing is three different types of judgments that are all going to take place in the tribulation period, and they're not necessarily going to run side by side like that. One of the things that they will say in making their case is that um, each of the uh, accounts of the seals, trumpets, and vials ends with a statement like this. Well, but the problem is that doesn't really end the account. It ends with a statement like that, but then it starts all over with a whole new set of judgments. And here in Revelation 12 is another statement that sounds like it's done. If, you're not, if you don't take it in context with everything else. But it's saying something that is true, but it's just not complete yet. The Bible also says, for example, that you are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. No, you're not. You're seated right here. Well, wait a minute. Is the Bible lying? Is the Bible wrong? No, the Bible is making a statement from the perspective of heaven that is not totally played out yet on earth. That you and I are in Christ. That's why you're eternally secure. You cannot lose your salvation. You're in Christ. And you are, in the eyes of God, already seated in heavenly places. But it hasn't taken place in time yet, in your existence yet. It's as good as done, and that's why God speaks of it as done. But it hasn't happened practically yet. You understand that? That's the same thing we're seeing here. It says that now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God. It's because they're witnessing what's going on on earth. 
it's taking place. It's playing out right before their eyes. But we'll see that it's not done in a practical sense yet because we pick up and see that this is a declaration in heaven. But it's yet to play out on earth. Now, if you have a problem with that, you just have a problem with the existence of God. God is God. When God says something, that settles it. Amen? I mean, I've taught this many times before, but it's been a while, so I'll repeat myself. God says it, that settles it. But you've seen the bumper stickers that say, God settles it, I believe it, that settles it. No, that settles it whether you believe it or not. Amen. You just better believe it so you're on the right side. Amen? Yeah. Well, in verse 11, it tells you how this is going to play out. Beginning in verse 11, it says the following. Read that with me. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Of course, that is a wonderful attitude to have right here now. Um, there's a practical application that you, you should have that same attitude. How do we overcome? By working. And we're going to work and work and work, and eventually one of these days we're going to make it. Amen? <laughs> No, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. If you had to rely on your works, you're done, you're toast. Stick a fork in them. But it's not your works. That's not how you overcome. We work because we have overcome. And we didn't overcome by our own efforts and our own works. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. That in a practical sense, you can apply that. If you ever start to feel like you're being drawn away. You ever start to doubt. You ever start to uh, be discouraged. What's your testimony? Remember where you came from. Remember how God saved you. Remember what He saved you out of. Remember that you and I, me and you both are scum. Yes. And God has saved us in spite of that. See, I say it. The reason why people aren't getting saved today, you don't see very many people getting saved today. You want to know why? Because they are brainwashed into self-esteem. They think highly of themselves. No, as a Christian, you have a revelation that I don't think highly of myself. I think highly of He that is in me. Greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. But today, people are saying, great is me. I'm special. I'm wonderful. God made me just the way I am and I don't need to change. No, that's not what the Bible says. No. The Bible says that you were born in sin. You were conceived in sin. You were born with a sinful nature. Even as a little child, they've got to walk around and smack your hand because you're born in sin. They've got to change your diaper because you're fallen and you still mess your pants. Uh -huh. And as you get older, your sins just get worse. Bigger. The resonation, the ripple effects are worse. Well, what's that mean? That means you need to understand that it's only by being born again and the Holy Spirit of God coming into you. What am I telling you? Remember your testimony. It's an encouragement to you in those dark days. It's an encouragement to you when you are discouraged and things are falling all around you and you just feel like giving up. And then you remember, hey man, this isn't about me. God isn't judging me based on how good I do everything. God has judged my sins at the cross. My sins are judged. I'm saved. Now it's just a pleasure to serve Him. I'm not trying to earn His grace and earn His love. He loves me. Wait a minute. Because of me? No, in spite of me. He loves me because when He looks at me, He sees His Son, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. This refers to the believers in the text who turned to Jesus Christ during Daniel's 70th week. Andrew was talking about a guy who's acting like, oh yeah, I can't wait. You guys get raptured out of here. We're going to have a party. He's either just being stupid or he's a fool. There's a difference. You can be stupid just by talking around your mouth or you can actually believe that nonsense and then you're a fool. After the rapture, we have been studying what's going to happen. You need to listen to those messages if you had not heard them. If you think the world's bad now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Go watch a Holocaust movie. You still ain't seen nothing yet. 
go look at what has happened throughout history and Jesus said no matter what you watch and see in history, you ain't seen nothing yet. The great tribulation will be worse than anything we've experienced or even seen in history. And during that time, people who were left behind after the rapture will turn to Jesus Christ. And unlike most professing Christians who are here now, these people will love not their lives unto death. Yeah. It won't be about them. It will be about Jesus. And they will go, go, go until they, they kill them. They'll be just like those apostles and those early Christians. But Israel at this time, Revelation 12, Israel is still in unbelief. And you hear these guys say, well, those Jews over in Israel, that can't be a fulfillment of prophecy. They're still in unbelief. And I just want to say, duh! <laughs> That's what the Bible says would happen. So when you see Israel over there, and better than 80% of them reject the existence of God, and like 1% or 2% believe in Jesus Christ, that's what the Bible says would happen. And during the tribulation, Israel is still in unbelief all the way up to this time when they are going to be attacked and run out of Israel one last time. In the tribulation, one last time, the Jews get pushed out of Israel. They get pushed out in unbelief. And now we see the final chastisement of this stiff-necked, rebellious nation. We love the Jews, we support Israel, but Romans chapter 11 still says they are enemies for the gospel's sake. They choose to be. And I say they as in all but a small percentage of them. Now, Gentiles seem to not pay attention that the majority of Gentiles are too. But when we're talking about them, we're talking about them. When we're talking about Israel, we're talking about Israel. And right here, we're talking about Israel. And beginning of verse 12, we see this final chastisement where God allows them to be chased out of their land in unbelief, but He saves a remnant. Beginning of verse 12, read that with me. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. You have these people all, all day long running around saying, I rebuke you, devil. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And all that. They have no idea what they're talking about. That's not biblical. The devil is not omniscient or omnipresent. He can't be all places at all times. And when you women are putting your lipstick on and it breaks, that wasn't the devil. I'm, I'm sorry, but he's got bigger things to tackle than your lipstick. And people are always rebuking the devil. Let me tell you something. When the devil comes down here and spends full time on earth, you'll know it. That's what's called the Great Tribulation. He ain't here. He's, he, he is seeking who he may devour and all that, but he's part time in heaven, part time on the earth. We talked about that in the last study. When this happens, he not only is full time destroyer of the earth, but he is hot, white hot with wrath. <laughs> Because he knows his time is short. It'll be like nothing mankind has ever seen. Verse 10 is true. Verse 12 shows that it is true in reality in heaven, but yet to be enforced on the earth. In other words, verse 10, where they made the announcement in heaven, that's true. But verse 12 tells us that we still got a lot to see happen on the earth. You ask the question, you think the world is bad now? Wait till this happens. When the Bible says, whoa, it's not the fawns. Whoa. I mean, that's not what he's saying. And some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but some of you do. The Bible says, whoa, it is like, whoa. It is sobering, somber, serious, whoa. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. The church isn't there. But everybody else who is, woe. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath. Why? Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He's been busy, folks. You think he's been busy? Yes. Wait till he's full time on the earth and knows he's got a short time. And Satan's wrath is directed toward uh, one race in particular. There's one race that he's after. We'll see why. 
It tells us why. Verse 13, read it. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. It kind of gives the picture that Satan has cast the earth and he kind of comes to. And he wants to go to heaven, but he can't. And he realizes, this is it. I'm done. I've only got a short time. But in, he's insane. And you say, well, why, would this, why would Satan do that? Why would he think like that? And I always ask people, why do all our unsaved relatives and friends think the way they do? That's just as insane. They know they're sinners. They know they need salvation, but yet they reject Jesus and choose to go to hell. How insane is that? Well, you have Lucifer. He, I think he knows that he's doomed, and yet, what else is there for him? But to try to overthrow the plan of God. And so he does with everything in him. And now look, in verse 13 it says, He persecuted the woman, and in chapter 12, we established that the woman was Israel. Who is this woman? It's the woman which brought forth the man-child. That can't be uh, Mary, because Mary is dead. And her soul and spirit went to be with the Lord. But Mary's body is still buried somewhere over in the Middle East. She's waiting for the rapture just like everybody else. She's waiting for that trump to sound and the dead in Christ rise first is when Mary comes up and gets her body. If you pray to Mary right now, you might as well pray to the tree out there or you may as well pray to this light over here because Mary's not hearing your prayers and answering them. Mary is a saint just like every other born-again Christian. She's in the presence of the Lord just like every other born-again Christian. She's blessed among women but she's only a woman. She's not a goddess. She's not the queen of heaven. And she is not who this is referring to here. In Revelation 12, she's in heaven and has received her glorified body with the rest of the saints. This is talking about the woman as in Israel. And if you look in Isaiah 9-6, you don't have to turn there because we've read that a couple of times, but make a note of Isaiah 9-6. For unto us a child is born. Who's us? Israel. Unto us, a woman who is in us. <laughs> That's a nation, Israel. A child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. But I thought Jesus just came to save me. What's all this about a government? Because it ain't about you. It ain't about me. We praise God that we've been grafted in, but it ain't about us. We're an afterthought, folks. Just get used to it. We're an afterthought that's been saved in spite of us, and for all of eternity, we're going to praise God for it. Amen? Amen. Hey, you're going to be, I'm not going to, you're going to be up there saying, well, I can't really feel good about myself because it wasn't really about me after all. <laughs> no, you're going to be glad you're in heaven. You're going to be praising God for it, and you're going to give Him glory for His plan, which includes this word right here, government. One government. His government. The government. Yeah. And world history is man's attempt to overthrow his government. Yeah. If you read history with the right goggles on, it's man overthrowing God. Did the, did the Bible perversion say the governments of the earth shall be upon I, I'd have to check that. I didn't, I didn't run river. I don't think so, but there might be. But the government shall be upon his shoulder. Who? The child. Jesus. And His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Yeah. But uh, people will use these words even about Jesus, but they don't use them in the context. Prince of Peace, He's not about what's going on here in the United Nations and all this nonsense. He's the Prince of Peace who has died to pay for the sins of the whole world and you can have peace with God through His blood, faith in His shed blood and His resurrection, and the hope of eternal life that will include sitting under Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. His government, the government that shall be upon His shoulders as believers, we're going to have a part in that. We need it now. Not because of you, but you're allowed in. Amen? Now, here's the opposite. This is the, the, the flip side of this. The God of this world is about to lose this world. You see, Satan is the God of this world. He is, I believe that's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He is the prince and the power of the air. 
He is in control of the world's governments right now. Now, God's plan is going to work out, but when you go back, go back and read, we read in Daniel where the prince of Persia actually had a demonic angel, a devil angel, a fallen angel, whatever you want to call him, controlling things. There are dark powers, principalities and powers who are causing all this to happen, and they think that they're causing something to happen that can overthrow God. They think that they're winning. You know what? God's just sent up there saying, that what just unbelievable imbecilic spirits. <laughs> but he'll, He's going to make it all go according to His plan. And that's why verse 7 in Re- Isaiah 9-6 is a great verse, but always read verse 7 with it. Read that with me. Of the increase of His what? Say that again. Of the increase of His government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's settled. God says it. That settles it. The throne of David. David was dead and gone when this was spoken. But yet, it's upon the throne of David. That's the coming Messiah on the throne of David. World history, as I said, is the story of the battle to rule the world. Man trying to overthrow God's rule. Daniel 2.44, I want to quote that real quick. It says in Daniel 2.44, when we studied in Daniel, and in the days of these kings, talking about the kings of the horns at the end, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. There'll be one shot at it at the end of the millennium and they'll fail. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. You've got to read the Bible as more than your own personal devotional cookbook that you open up and say, oh, make me feel good about myself today. <laughs> That's, the Bible should make you feel good but not because it just tells you how wonderful you are. The Bible makes you feel good because it tells you how lost you are without Jesus, but how saved you are with Him. And it tells you what's in store for you because you're saved. So you can feel real good about the future. Even if the present isn't good, don't just start doing what the... the, you know. Instead of teaching the truth, what modern teachers are telling you is to just check out and pretend. I am wealthy, I am healthy, I am happy, I am beautiful, I am, I am, I am, and that's, that's the I am's of Joel Osteen or whatever, and they just want to tell you, that, and you're supposed to psych yourself out and make yourself think that you're happy and everything's great. And go. Hey, listen, you face reality and can still have joy, but you have the joy in the truth, not in a lie. You don't get joy out of psyching yourself out. You get joy because of what the Bible says about your future. That's why you can sacrifice the present. You can sacrifice in the here and now because of the future. And if you're not buying into this future story that we're talking about, you will not sell out in the present. You want to know why people are loving not their life unto death? Because they have bought into the program and they understand that seven year period is going to be really bad and they're going to probably die because they won't take the mark. But oh, the glory that we have ahead of us. It's worth it. Off with his head. They're going to be saying, yeah! You know, number 500 next. Oh, that's me! That's me! You say, that's crazy. They're going to be excited about it. Hey, you go through, read through church history, you find that. Stories of men whose wives died, and they were like, she's with the Lord! She's with the Lord! It's glory, glory! And they jumped around and said, what's wrong with him? Didn't she die? Yeah, he's excited about where she's at. I mean, wouldn't that be wild to have that kind of an attitude? I got, I'm not bragging, I'm, no, I'm normal, and I mourn over the death of loved ones just like anybody else, but I can't help it. My great uncle Earl just went to be with the Lord. Amen. And I was thinking, wow. I mean, just think of where he's at right now, Thomas. Yes, sir. And you think of the little boy Isaac who died. Oh, it's so sad for the family and for the people left behind, but not for Isaac. Isaac's with the Lord. He didn't have to live through all this. Amen. I mean, he's not five, but if you were, he'd be up there going, eh, you know. <laughs> I didn't have to go through all that. 
Oh man, let me go on. The book of Revelation ends with the king of kings on his throne in Revelation 19. We're going to get there. But all this about the kingdom, all this about the battle for the world and the control, it comes to an end in Revelation 19. I just want to remind you, remind you that that's how it ends. The king of kings on a throne. Keep that. That's, that's your future. That's what it's all about. Now read 14 with me. And to the woman, read now with me. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now we covered this, the wilderness, and all the references through the Old Testament. It's a place called Petra. We studied that. The message, I think, is already online. But you can watch that or you can just do your own research about the wilderness of Seir where Petra is, this rock city. And it's already fortified. They've already got toilets <laughs> and showers and things. I mean, it's all ready for them. All, you know, and right now, just tourists go in there, but there's coming a time when Israel's going to go down. Now, some guys like to play around with this phrase here, wings of a great eagle, and they try to come up with uh, their explanation. Have fun with that. I'm, <laughs> I don't claim to know what that means. I think one of the most interesting is that since the United States uh, official uh, emblem is an eagle, that they try to claim that the United States... Hey, how many of you saw that? I think it's called Omega Code. It's a movie put out a few years ago by TBN, Omega Code. A few of you have seen that. And in that movie, the United States of America comes in and is used of God to save Israel. <laughs> I don't personally believe that. Um, I, I don't know what this means exactly, except that it just says what it says. Uh, Those of them that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. That's a promise. So I know there's a connection there, uh, but I don't know exactly what to say that is, but we know it's true. And she might fly into the wilderness, and folks like Noah Hutchings and others really believe there's going to be like airplanes come in and take Israel over, or at least a lot of them are going to fly. And uh, they could. I mean, right outside of Petra, there's plenty of places where you could land a plane. It's just flat desert. Um, and we talked about how she's going to be nourished for a time and how that might be manna again. We talked about that in a previous study. And a time is one times is two and a half. That's three and a half. That's half the tribulation. Half the tribulation. And we're not done with that, so we're going to come back to that in a minute. Okay. The Bible mentions that same amount of time in a different way in just a moment. So we know this coincides with the Obama... I said Obamination. <laughs> That's a different, different one. Ab abomination of desolation. As Jesus foretold, if you want to turn there real quick, Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. And we're going to see that the prophecies of Jesus tie in with this. We've already been showing you, if you've, watched, if you've been here uh, through the studies or if you watch them online, you'll see that every study we've pointed out where other prophecies from other books in the Bible match what we're seeing in Revelation 12. We see Aunt Michael standing up in Revelation 12. We saw Michael stand up in Daniel 12. That's one of the tie-ins. Here we see Jesus talking about this very same event in Mark chapter 13. You also find this in Matthew 24. But we're going to read the account in Mark 13 beginning in verse 14. It says, But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, where did he speak of it? Daniel 9.27. Be sure to visit our website at bbfohio.com for links to hundreds of audio and video messages, as well as articles, links, and other free resources, and a new bookstore being developed offering additional items. This message was brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship. I am Pastor Greg, and we thank you for listening.